Thank you for inviting me to your club. My talk is about the UN and the UNA. The UN story is a story about the struggles of governing the relationship between sovereign states. The story of how people in the world have attempted to live together in peace since the two world wars. And the UNA is about local communities throughout the UK and internationally supporting these efforts. The world wars have brought about huge changes to the way, way people wanted their futures to be, different from the past. However, there have been many other challenges in the world since then that demand urgent reforms of the UN. The objective of my talk today is to share my understanding of the problems faced by the UN with people from my local community. My name is Sohel Shariar. I'm the chair of United Nations Association, Harpenden. Before I begin my talk, I would like to tell you a bit about me and why I'm interested in the UN. I was born in the Indian subcontinent in Bangladesh. I came to the UK to study science at the age of 17 on my own. Eight years before I was born, India had become independent from Britain. The British partition created a state whose western and eastern wings were separated by a thousand miles, an unstable solution for the state of Pakistan. In 1971, Bangladesh gained freedom from Pakistan prompted by the Pakistani army genocide. The US and UK governments had supported Pakistan, India and Russia supported Bangladesh. I was 16 at that time and I was observing at first hand how sovereign states interacted with each other how they cooperated and how they conflicted with each other, all very real to me at a young age. However, in the first five years of arriving in the UK, I had to focus on my studies, leading to a degree in astronomy from University College London. I studied how the universe was formed and architected, and indeed I wondered if there were any signs of who the architect was. Alas, no, not directly. In the next 40 years, I applied the technical skills I acquired to build a career, first in oil exploration and later in cybersecurity as a systems architect. But as, as I approached retirement, I realized there was a big gap in my understanding, that of this world, its people and societies. And I started reading about anthropology, history, sociology, and geopolitics. So when I retired last year and was offered to take over the chair of the UNA local group, I said yes. This brought in my other interests such as climate change, inequality, democracy, and other global problems looking for solutions. And this is the reason why I'm here today talking to you. Now to my talk. I will start with the historical summary of what led to the formations of the UN and UNA. I will give you a brief tour of the Harpenden Group and its recent program of activities. I will end with a list of daunting problems facing the UN and essentially the world. The comments and opinions in this talk are mine only and do not represent the views of the UN or UNA. From European antiquity, from the days of the Greek philosophers to the rise of the German philosophers. Intellectuals have been wondering how sovereign states can live together with peace and security. I'll mention two individuals by way of example. The first is Thucydides, who lived in the 5th century BC Athens. He's known as the father of political realism. He viewed the political behavior of individuals and the subsequent outcomes of relations between states is ultimately guided by fear and self-interest. I believe this is still relevant today, such as the Russian fear of NATO, the West's fear of Russia, the US fear of China, and vice versa, plus the self-interest of the US globally. The second individual was Bismarck of Germany, who lived in the 19th century. After gaining Russian dominance, Bismarck skillfully used balance of power diplomacy to maintain Germany's position in a peaceful Europe. For many historians, Bismarck was a world champion at the game of multilateral diplomatic chess for almost 20 years after 1871. Starting from prehistory, as the age of hunter-gatherers phase ended and the agricultural way of life became prevalent, 
people started settling down in larger and larger groups in villages, towns, and cities. Ancient cities such as Athens, Rome, and later European cities like London became seats of powerful monarchies such as Spanish, British, and French. These monarchies enlarged their nation states by colonizing other peoples and their lands. And then came industrialization, where people from the rural countryside started moving and settling in urban areas, creating the shape of the countries in Europe prior to World War I. In the rest of the world, after World War II, the end of European colonization meant new countries gaining freedom and becoming sovereign states. Today, the total number of states in the world stands at 196. So we can say with some certainty that sovereignty is here to stay as the desired state of all countries of the world. But how do you curb aggression of one state towards another, most often toward their neighbor, other than countries such as the US, which can do that anywhere in the world? In other words, how does one keep sovereignty, sovereign states in check? The idea of a universal association of mankind was very much in the minds of intellectuals in the 19th century. The first example of a successful association was the formation of the Red Cross. Uh, this was uh, formed by a Swiss businessman called Henry Dunant. He was a devout Calvinist who, after seeing the wounded soldiers in one of the battles being waged by Napoleon III in Italy, came up with the idea of the Red Cross. The first intergovernmental organization was founded, that was founded was the League of Nations. It was formed in 1920 at the Paris Peace Conference, which ended the First World War. Its goals were stated in a covenant based on Immanuel Kant's perpetual peace a philosophical sketch. Its permanent member states were Britain, France, Italy, and Japan. Germany became a permanent member in 1926, but later both Germany and Japan left the League. The problem with the League was its short-sightedness and lack of ambition. The members deemed that wars between states were typical and necessary. They saw no need to prevent wars. World War I, they naively thought, was a war to end all wars. Then World War II happened. It was, a direct, it was an indirect consequence of the Versailles Peace Treaty. The treaty had blamed Germany for starting the war, requiring Germany to disarm and pay very harsh reparations. The result, resulting World War II was the deadliest military conflict in history. According to Wikipedia, over 100 million people perished, or 4% of the world's 2.3 billion in 1940, and 50% of the deaths were in Russia and China. The United Nations came into being directly after the end of World War II with the aim of preventing future wars. On 24 October 1945, the UN became the world's foremost intergovernmental association. It succeeded the League of Nations. Since then, 193 out of 196 countries of the world became its members. As a condition of membership, they have all had to sign up to the UN Charter, committing them to maintain peace and security. The UN is effectively a body of people appointed by their governments to represent their sovereign states. These people are not selected from ordinary people like you and me. The decisions they make at the UN are made on behalf of their governments. So when the UN was formed, there was recognition by the founding members that a people's movement was needed behind the UN. The UNA was this grassroots body representing the peoples of the sovereign states. The goals of UNA are to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, reaffirm faith in human rights, promote social progress, practice tolerance, and live together in peace. In short, goals for ordinary people to achieve, not for governments to do so on their behalf. Groups like the Harpenden Group sprang up across the world in towns, cities, and universities. There are today about 100 such local groups in the UK with a total of about 20,000 supporters. The local groups are loosely coordinated under a single UNA UK entity representing UNA for the UK. Worldwide, there are 100 other countries having such groups. Together, there's a worldwide federation of UNA associations 
with people from different countries independently participating in activities like what Harpenden does. UNA Harpenden Group was formed in 1947. It replaced a League of Nations group that had existed in Harpenden since 1922. Today, UNA Harpenden has over 200 signed up supporters. They come not just from Harpenden, but also from St. Albans and Wheat Hampstead. The Harpenden Group represents these areas for UNA UK. Anyone living and or working in these areas can join the group. Joining is voluntary. That is, there is no membership fee or any requirement apart from allowing the user one's name and email address to be kept in touch. No other personal details are required. The group has a constitution agreed by the supporters attending our annual AGMs. Committee members are elected at the AGMs. The committee consists of a chair, vice chair, treasurer, and secretary, plus a small number of committee members without portfolios. As a group, we are affiliated with the UNA UK. UNA UK has no financial or legal response relationship with our group, apart from the requirement to fulfill certain obligations and activities each year. UNA UK is headquartered in Whitehall. It has a chairman, Baroness Joyce of St. John's, a management staff of 12 and a board of trustees. It is a registered charity and receives donations from supporting organizations and membership fees of 10 pounds per annum, which by the way, is voluntary. The UNA UK acts as a secretariat for the all party parliamentary group of, on the UN. It has direct contact with MPs and other influences of the UN. The UNA Harpenden Group is also a member of UNA LASER, LASER standing for London and Southeast region, which is a collection of 30 groups in this region, including the universities. Through UNA LASER, our supporters can contribute and influence the resolutions of UNA UK. These resolutions allow UNA UK to influence the government, including foreign and Commonwealth development offices. The main activities of UNA Harpenden are holding regular public meetings that bring awareness of issues relevant to the UN and which promote the objectives of the UN. Over the last 12 months, our public meetings included talks from a variety of speakers, from universities, charities, non-government agencies, and others. Their subjects included climate change, Palestine, refugees, sociology, human rights, charities, and geopolitics. Most talks are held in person at local halls, such as the Salvation Army Hall. Some talks are held via Zoom. Atten attendance is free for all, Collections received at public meetings are used to cover our hall hiring and other small costs. From time to time, we donate any remaining money to charities that are relevant to the UN. UNA Harpenden has a monthly newsletter which promotes notices, provides notices of meetings and news about issues and events relevant to the UN. Anyone can subscribe to our newsletter. And all our information, including our history, past events, and lately videos and recordings of the talks, are available to the public via our website. Our group email address is una.harpenden at gmail.com. So what does the UN structure look like? It has a general assembly where all the 193 members are represented and they hold annual, annual sessions. The current session is the 76th session. There is a Security Council with the, uh, the victors of World War II, China, France, Russia, UK, US. There's an International Court of Justice, not to be confused with the International Criminal Court. And there's the Secretariat where Antonio Guterres is the cu current Secretary General of the UN. So what are the successes of the UN? Most importantly, Almost all sovereign states in the world are UN members. This commits them in principle not to wage war. Over the last 75 years, hundreds of small and medium wars have been avoided with the engagement of the UN. Most of these do not appear in the front page of our mainstream media. UN groups like G20, UNHCR, WHO, UNICEF, UNDP, FAO, IMF, and World Bank Group have helped the development of many countries, including saving people from disasters, emergencies, and pandemics. 
As an intergovernmental association of sovereign states, therefore, there is nothing better than the UN. So what is the future of the UN? Here, there are many serious problems that needs to be overcome. One of the key problems is a Latin saying, quis custodiet ipsos custodis, or who will guard the guards themselves. The Security Council consists of the victors of World War II and is no longer appropriate. India, which is nearly the most populous country in the world and the fifth largest economy, larger than UK or France, is not a permanent member of the Council. The permanent members of the Council often use their veto powers to preempt action or agreement to the UN. In the 75 years since the formation of the UN, the US has gone to war and invaded other countries more than 75 times, killing millions in the process in Korea, Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, and elsewhere. Russia is the latest bully with its invasion of Ukraine. Powerful countries apply economic, trade, and other sanctions unilaterally without UN approval, and therefore illegal as per the UN Charter. The US-controlled IMF and World Bank have kept, kept many underdeveloped countries in perpetual debt. They have effectively taken more money from the indebted countries than they have given to them. The General Assembly is subservient and dominated by the Security Council, giving it hardly any voice. In this assembly, China and India, with over a billion people each, have one, just one vote each, the same as Montserrat and Tuvalu, which have 10,000 people or less. Therefore, the voices of the people of the world are not being fairly represented. The people of the world need a voice. This is especially so when representative democracies are becoming increasingly oligarchic and the gap between the so-called democratic and state-controlled governments are decreasing. And with the current forms of democracy and capitalism, many of the important wishes and aspirations of the world's people are not being fulfilled. In addition, the risk of new pandemics, climate change, geopolitical conflicts, threats to nuclear war, and demographic changes are very real and are endangering the future of our species and that of the world. We need new and sustainable solutions, and we need them now. On that happy note, I end my talk.